I've already had a little word with Roger over here. He's trying to figure me out tonight. Only God can, okay? So uh, one of those things. But, you know, something I prayed for today and uh, I ask because I have an opportunity to come and to uh, take this spot for this evening. And I said, Lord, give us 12 people. We got more than 12. But, you know, one of the things I wanted 12 people 12 turned the world upside down. Whew. And I know that tonight what God has for us to feast on is the fact that we can be one of those who can change this world. And when we look at what God has the ability of doing through a vessel, through us, we just give him thanks. We just give him praise for what he's going to do tonight. So welcome to Day Star, and we thank you for coming, and uh, just remember what it's all about. We came to praise him. We came to worship him. We came to give him thanks and glory for all those things that are coming forth. And, and real quickly, we'll run through some things that's coming up, and one thing that's coming up, too, that we have a table shower out here for Brianna. It's out. Uh, she's going to be a baby girl coming our way. So the table set up out here near the foyer. So just be knowledgeable of that, okay? And the music ministry meeting is going to happen not what in the day. It was next week. How about that? See, I was trying to use my memory. How about that? <laughs> See, anyway, in the Carowinds trip, Okay, that's on the 23rd, and of course today you were supposed to see someone about giving them money. If you didn't do it, it'll still be okay. Just give them your name, all right? And remember Catalyst coming up here on November the 4th, and uh, if you can help provide in there and do things, it'll be most appreciated there. So just keep this in prayer. Senior Adult Fellowship. And uh, in the midst of all this, we're getting older. How about that? So some people like to sit down and eat, all right? So we're going to go to Jones's Fish Camp. Uh, some people get excited about that, but the one big thing, we're going to leave here at 5.15 on that Saturday afternoon, and we're going to be sitting down somewhere around 6 o'clock, but I need to know exactly how many people are coming because the number of people that comes determines where we're going to eat at in the building, okay? So uh, do that. Just sign up for that. So appreciate that. Okay. Remember tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to be having our prayer time. And uh, God does some mighty things in that, that he can reveal unto us the needs and seek prayers that are answered and know and have those knowledge of that. So we just praise God for that. Also on Wednesday night, we're going to be back in the book of James. So I'll be here at 7 o'clock uh, for that. Okay. And of course, all the classes and everything there, the young adults, and all the kids, all this is happening and nursery schedule and if you're on it you know it so praise the lord how about that you know what it's, it's exciting that when we come together and uh, pray together seek god together and i'm going to share a little bit later on some prayer things in the midst of the message that god has given but uh whenever we look at it and i know that we have prayed for these individuals i don't believe anybody else has been added to it i don't see any and uh but as we go through and we pray and we ask god to deliver these people from different situations in their life, whether it be cancer, whether it be other things, whether it be uh, disabilities of in any sort. And you know anything that's hanging on to you is a disability. That uh, you've, you've got to come and to re release that, it's got to go, okay? <laughs> in Jesus' name. But all these things, but you know, one of the things that the Lord impressed me tonight is the fact not only to ask, <coughs> excuse me, not only to ask, but to thank Him. Thank him. You say, well, it hadn't happened yet. No, you thank him first. It's the fact that we wait on things to transpire in our lives. We wait on the evidence that we can see. My friends, it's happening before we ever see it. We need to thank God before when we ask. We need to thank him because that is a, our faith that says, Lord Jesus, you have got it in your hand. You're able and you're complete in this. We thank him at the very beginning. Thank you, Father, for these things. And we just thank you, Father, for the fact to hear that Lee McFarland, the stroke, and 
uh, Jeff and Phyllis Turner. Lord, we've gone through them and know them from so many times. Father, we just thank you for uh, turning this situation around. We thank you, Father God, for Leonard Moose throat cancer, Father God, that you are able to heal it. You're able to bring forth life where there is death that is coming. Father, we just thank you for that. And we just thank you, Father God, for uh, the hospice care, for, Lord, for the peace over Betty Jo, Lord God, that, that you're bringing. And Father, I thank you for Clay Goodson and, and the Goodson family and the things that he's going through and treatments for the cancer. Lord, I know that you're able to do these things, and we just thank you for it even now. And Father, we just thank you for Hunter, for the guidance and healing, Father God, that, that he can open his ears to hear you speak, not someone else, that you speak into his life. We thank you for that. And Lord, I just thank you for Fred, Lord God, that you will continue to touch him, that you'll continue to heal him and bring healing, Father God. And Lord, we know that his days here upon this earth are not long, but there will be a complete healing across the river. On the other side, when we get home, all these things will be gone and everything will be changed. And we just thank you for that, Father. We thank you, Father, for Mary who has given her life in, uh, in the ministry and majority of the time in New York City and more Manhattan. She was there whenever the towers came down and, and the cancer and everything she's suffering from has been brought on by those things, what she endured during that time. But Lord, I just thank you for Mary and, and her testimony. I thank you, Father God, for, for what she's doing in the midst of all these things, Father. Lord, I just thank you for your healing power upon her. And Father, for Aaron Brightman, Father, we just thank you for, for guidance and protection upon his life. Lord, guide him. <laughs> Take him by the hand, Father, and lead him through these times, Father God. I just thank you. And Lord, for Matt, I thank you, Father, for, for his throat condition, Father God. I thank you that, that in the midst of this, that there will be a time that he can learn and he can sense you and he knows your presence and he can sense your presence even as you're bringing forth a newness in his life and in his body. I thank you for that, Father. And Lord, I thank you for baby Roland Arrowwood, Father God, for the surgery cover. I thank you, Father, that what you're doing in that, in the midst of it, and to glorify you for that, Father. I just thank you for it. And Lord, for Bessie Reynolds, Lord, for the healing that needs to come in her life and, and the completeness that needs to come in her life. And Lord, in these last days of our lives, as we are growing older, Lord God, that you can give us peace, you can give us comfort, and we can give have assurance of who you are in our life because we can feel your hand. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, for Ethel Avery, She's having difficulty in walking, Lord God. And I just pray that you will give her stronger legs, stronger feet, and a stronger attitude that she can get up and she can go. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in her life. And, Lord, I thank you for Ashley and Hannah Tabor, Tabor Father, for the car accident, for those things which have happened there. Lord God, I just praise you for that. And, Lord, one's not there but our granddaughter, Father God, we just thank you that she came through a car wreck and everything was destroyed and the motors landed part of it out of the car and the windshield's gone the trunk's gone everything's gone flipped three times and she has a bruise lord thank you for watching after her and i praise you father for what you're doing in the midst of this and father i just thank you lord god that this nine-year-old lord god that we talked about this morning lord you see the conditions you know the conditions and lord i just pray that in the midst of this that you can see our condition. And, Lord, that you can bring us to a place that we can really look at you and, and recognize who you are. And, Lord God, that you're enough for whatever situation might come in our life, that you're enough. And, Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in the lives of this people. I glorify you and I praise you. And, Lord, we just ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And we just glorify you. We thank you. I talk to this sweet young lady over here behind me, she's on my right side, so you know that's a good side. She's going to bring a song to us, and after that, then we'll get into the message of the scripture, what God has for us today, okay?
I pray tonight that uh, before we leave here tonight that we can really say that in our life it's all well. It's well with my soul. And, uh, you know, whenever we look at this, and, and I'm, I'm pulling a cheat on you, okay? 
So you might have to adjust this sound, all right? Because uh, I just wanted to get ready for church. How about that? Have you ever done that? We, we getting ready? All right. Ro Roger told me that this morning, you know, he came in with a T-shirt on. And I came in with a, a shirt and a tie on. He said, you looked dressed like you was going to preach. And, and I didn't look that way. And then tonight you're supposed to preach. And you come in and you got a T-shirt on. And he said, something's up. But, you know, <clears throat> I just wanted to put a uh, shirt on. And, of course, we know that, uh, and I'll pick it Sister Marie, but, you know, white reveals all. And the white reveals all the fact that usually you wear a white T-shirt underneath a white shirt. That would be the sensible thing. Who can see it? You know, one of the things that we look at, you know, who can see the fact that uh, I got ring around the collar? It's been a war before. It's wrinkled. Who can see the fact that uh, tomorrow my pants need to go and be clean because there's a food stain on my knee, okay? Enjoying it too much. Who can see? And, and that's one of the things that tonight we want to look at. Who can see? Who can see the things that my life testifies of but are not? You see, it's very easy to put on a white shirt. And you can wear a white shirt all you want to, and you can come to the house of God or anywhere else. But you know, the thing that, that really we need to focus on tonight is the fact that we, and our whole topic of, is the fact of a new life in Christ. A new man. A new person. Because we come and we look at this and we understand one thing about it, that sometimes we say that we are, but we've taken a white garment and placed it over darkness that's in our life. We place it over things that have been there for years and years and years, and we have got accustomed to them being there, and we're comfortable with them being there. But you know, tonight we're going to look in the scripture, we're going to go to Ephesians 4, we're going to be reading verses 17 through 21 first of all, and I'll ask you to stand as we read this. <clears throat> and we might have a little discrepancy as we go through tonight because what we're looking at scripture-wise is King James Version. <clears throat> what I typed off is New King James, so I'm going to do my best to see you and stay where you can know where I'm at. How about that? Praise the Lord. Okay. Verse 17 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, and having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. I'm, I'm, excuse me, okay. But you have not so learned Christ. If so, that be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And the reason, and Lord forgive me for kind of having a little laughter. This is New King James Version I'm reading up here, okay. It was uh, <clears throat> King James, so we thought, but it wasn't. How about that? So we had a change, a change that came. But we're going to look tonight at the new man, the new man that we are to be in Christ Jesus. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for all that you're about to do, not only what you've already done, but what you're about to do in our life. And we give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that Paul is writing here to the church of Ephesus, he said, This I say therefore and testify the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, or of another word for that is vanity of their mind. Now, whenever you come and you look at the very fact of 
how are we walking? And you have to understand that the, the, here the Ephesian church, the church at Ephesus, they were Gentiles. And here he's saying that you as Gentiles have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, but you're not to walk like all your other people around you. You're not to walk like all the other Gentiles walk. You're not to do these things because there's something that is to be different. You're not to walk in, in the very vanity of their mind. So whenever we look at this, it says, not as other Gentiles walk, lest his much-needed contribution to the church growth would surely be missed. Unbelieving Gentiles live in the vanity of their mind without proper purpose, causing all their efforts to attain happiness to end in failure. Everybody's looking to succeed. But here, Paul is writing to the fact that here, that as you're, if you're walking as a child of God and you're walking like other Gentiles, you're not going to succeed. You're going to be a failure. Because that's not the purpose of it. That's not what it's all about. He says, well, what, what is vanity? What is futility? The fact that whenever you're conceited, <laughs> when you have extreme pride in your ability, when you have pride in your possessions, and of course I can't speak for me, but when you have pride in your appearance and your beauty, okay? So, so any of those things, you know, where, where do we rest at? This is what I'm all about. This is me. This is where I'm at. But if we walk like the other Gentiles walk, because these were some of the things that the other Gentiles were doing. They were looking at things that they could do, that they had, that they were superior over. And yet Paul is relating something else. It says in verse 18, it says that by having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, cause, because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. What can't they see? The blindness of their heart refers to the darkness of their will, Gentiles fighting against the divine will that has caused them to be separated from God's life. Whenever we start <laughs> fighting against God's will, you ever fought God's will? Have you ever fought God's call? Have you ever been in a place of where God is directing you or asking you to do something and you're trying to find something else to fill that spot so we don't? won't have to bend and go that direction. One of the things that we can relate to and so many times in our life is the fact that God calls us, God wants us to do certain things. And I'm going to share something with you in just a few minutes about yesterday. Because I found out something totally different. And if I get weepy-eyed, you just pray for me, okay? But whenever we come through things and we loaded up the trailer and we were going to the farmer's market and, you know, you go with prospects of selling something and doing something and, and having a, a great day from it, nothing's happening. Nobody's buying. Few people come by and look and said, wow, and walked off. You know, sometimes you look at it, wow, well, this day's a waste. But the story's not finished yet. We'll get there in a little bit. Whenever we see God's divine will and the ignorance that they had about his will was there because of something we're going to find out just in a moment. In verse 19 he says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to the work of all uncleanliness with greediness, being past feeling means to become callous, become hardened. These unbelievers have gone to sl so deep in sin that they're insensitive to the moral right and wrong. They don't know what it is anymore. They don't know what's right and what's wrong. You just go and you live and you do it and you keep on going. Don't know whether it's right, whether it's before God, whether it's right, before the people that you're a witness to, whether it's right or wrong. You're just living. But they had gone so deep. They had lost all ability to know if what they were doing was right before God or whether it was wrong. Verse 20 says, but you have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn it from him. The writer goes on further to say in verse 21, he says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him 
as the truth is in Jesus. Every bit of the truth that we need is in Jesus Christ. And that which he speaks is the statement, his statement, and that's all that we need. To learn Christ means to learn Christian teaching. To learn Christian doctrine has instructed the readers not to live so, to live as unbelievers. I know that Pastor Roger was talking about this morning things that, that uh, will relate and keep people uh, or take people out of the church, if you want to put it that way. But I'm going to put it another way. It's not keeping them out. It's the fact that you come in our area today and we look and understand. And I praise God for every new person that comes through the door and every visitor that we have. And give God glory for that. Because of the fact that there's something that people are seeing in the churches today, not only where in this meeting house where we're meeting at, but in the churches around our county and around our country, they're seeing something that is not attracting them. And what they're seeing is me and you. They're seeing us. I know that, and I want to pick on Miss Catherine, Cat. She didn't know that was coming. But uh, she's hiding now from me. <laughs> anyway, that uh, she requested something. She requested because she, since she had believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, she had not been baptized, and she wanted to go up to the mountains, and she wanted to be baptized in the stream. So forth we did, okay? But let me tell you something. A lot of people who was looking at this young lady prior to that event and prior to the event that the pictures went on Facebook, and prior to the event that she told her friends, and prior to the event that even as she, and I'm putting her on the spot tonight, okay, but even these things that all of a sudden there comes a critical view of her life issue. Are you? Whenever you say that I go down the street and I go to this church or that church, I do this or that, or I'm a member of such and such a church, Back behind this, because I've been in the conversation, I've heard people talking, and here they start qu giving a, a real affirmative question. Do you really mean them? I don't see it. You see, the reason that there are not a lot of people that comes in our doors is the fact that they can't see someone to mark it or to mark their life after in the people they're looking at because there are certain things in their life that are not right. We're going to go on down to the next verse of Scripture, verse 22 in Ephesians 4. Just follow along. Whenever we look at this, it says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24 says, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. First thing that happens in verse 22 says you put it off. You get rid of that former conduct. You get rid of the things that comes out of your mouth. You get rid of the things that you've been doing. You, your life has changed. You're a new person. You get rid of the habits that you had. You get rid of the, the language and the slang that comes out of your lips. You get rid of those things. You put them off. You're to talk to be to put off the old man, to renounce the pre-conversion life and sins. It's gone. It's gone because you have accepted Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has came, come in, and he has brought his life into your life. And it's for us to remember the fact that wherever we go, Christ goes. Because if Jesus Christ truly is living in our life, that wherever we go, whatever place we go to, whatever we hear, whatever we see, whatever we touch, everything is there before Christ because Christ is in us. And as Christ is in us, then we are subjecting Jesus Christ to all types of things. When you stand there and look, look at trash or listen to trash and everything else, you are subjecting him not only yourself, you're subjecting Jesus Christ to that filth. 
So whenever we look at these things, it says to put it off. What does put it off mean? It means take it off, just like a shirt. Take it off. But also it says that here that we are to be renewed in spirit of our mind, to be constantly changed and be brought more and more into the line or into the line of God's own viewpoint. That every day that we're to be closer like Jesus Christ, we were to be closer to being like God than we have been the day before. Today you ought to be closer to him than you were yesterday. Tomorrow you ought to be closer to him than you are today. Because we are to be transformed. We're to be changed. We say in our life that we're changed. But whenever we're coming and we're aspiring to be one thing, that whenever our time comes to stand before Jesus Christ, we're going to be just like him. In thought, in mind, in heart, in speech. We've got to get there in a minute, okay? Whenever we think about these things, but it says here in verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and wholeness. That is to assume a new nature, a character, and conduct our life at conversion. And we say that something has happened in my life. And, of course, I've heard all the teachings and everything else that, you know, you can change something and you can change your, your mind your heart, but it takes a while to get on the outside change and everything to get rid of all the old habits and get rid of this and get rid of that and everything else. I just, I just praise God for the people, you know, and I've heard a lot of people say, you know, and testify the fact that I used to smoke, but now it even makes me sick if I smell it. You know, it, it's been a transformation. It's gone. That desire is not there any longer. And I pray that in our life that those things that once we were are not there any longer. It's gone. We're going down to verse 25 in, in this same chapter. and We've got a little bit of verses to go through tonight and we'll do it hastily. But do not grieve the Spirit. Verse 25 says, Therefore put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Verse 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't sin in anger. Don't let things upset you. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 27, nor give place or an opportunity to the devil. <laughs> you know what we're doing when we get all upset and angry? When we get pulled out of shape? We're giving an opportunity for Satan to use everything that we do, everything we say. He's going to use it. That's his doorway into your life. That's his doorway to tear you down. That's his doorway where somebody that's looking at your life, they say they're a Christian, but they're not. Just listen at them. Listen at their response. Verse 28 says, Let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that is what is good, that he may have something to give him who hath need. Verse 29, we're looking at the new believer, okay? Verse 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification or building up? That it may impart grace to the hearers, to the people who hear it. I'm letting God's word speak tonight. His word is stronger than mine. His word is purer than mine. But yet when we hear this, we need to understand what it's saying. Verse 30 says, And we do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit. Have you ever thought about it? And everybody's got one right by you. A messenger sent from God, an angel. A spirit that's there that hears you, that knows you, that senses everything you're doing. And you know, if they could talk to us, we would hear certain things like, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? Have you lost it? You know, that, that's, that's my wording, okay? 
because the Spirit of God hears and knows and is knowledgeable of everything that we think, everything we do, everything we say. What are you doing? And I, I asked Mr. Timms, because he, he's, he's a, a, an intellectual fellow back over here, you know, this morning. Because it's been so long, you know, I, you can tell I'm young, but I do remember CB radios. And when we was going up and down the road chattering on these things, and, and my question was, you know, you're hearing all about this in the 1050s and the 1020s and all this kind of thing. And, and I was not clear on what the 1020 was. I was thinking it was, you know, like, what's your location? Where are you? <laughs> so I, I was trying to find out from him because I could use it tonight. How about that? So I done used it. What's your 1020? Where are you? Where are we today as a believer? Where are we today in the profession of our life and confession of who we are? Where are we? Because I believe that many times that we come and we do grieve the Holy Spirit because we're not where we need to be. We're not where we need to be in, in the fact that as we do these things and we are sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit, and yet we're grieving the Holy Spirit. Verse 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, clamor means loud quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, with all care. Just get rid of it. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. He forgave you. Why do we go through all these different things in our life? Why do we have all these anger issues? Why do we have all these things that upset us? Some time ago, a gentleman was riding with me to Pocahontas and was coming back down the road, and he looked over at me and said, Jim, and this has been about three years ago, and, or four, I can't remember when, but anyway, it's back yonder. Time passing fast. <clears throat> he looked at me and he said, why don't you get upset? Why don't things kind of tear you out? I'm just kind of cool, okay? I just kind of go along with whichever the way the wind's blowing. I know which way it's going, you know. But, you know, it's not worth your testimony to let Satan come in and destroy your life before somebody else and destroy the witness that God has placed in you. It's not worth getting upset. It's not worth arguing, quarreling. It's not worth speaking evil of someone. It's not worth all these things that can come so easily out of our minds, minds and, and, and it goes through our mind first and then comes out of our mouth. The question is tonight, do you remember things in your life that you really wish wasn't there? As a Christian, have you ever made some really Dumb decisions, bad decisions, things that happens in our life. Well, we're going to go back and we're going to find some of these. So we're going to look at some painful memories for just a moment. Let's say we're going to, going to cruise through these. But painful memories. Back in Psalms 51, 3, and this is David speaking, it says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Do you realize that everything that is in your mind, in your life, that you have seen, that you have heard, that you have touched, whatever, it's still there? Everything. I can remember things from way back whenever I was a child, that I, things that I saw on a school bus with 12th graders that I should not have had my eyes on it, but I can still remember the name of the book. I can still remember all those things. Whatever you go through, whatever you do, wherever you transpire, it stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. It's in your life. Those experiences stay there, and I wish it wasn't there. But David is saying, my sin, my shortcomings, those things that I've done in my life, the mistake with Bathsheba, and it was a mistake, but it was a lust. But whenever we look at these things, he says, this sin, my sin, my iniquity, my transgression, as you go forth in, in this, he's looking at it, these things are all in this as he relates it. It is first person singular. It's me, Lord. Nobody else. It's just me. It's my sin. <laughs> it's my iniquity. It's my transgression. 
all these things, Lord, it's me. And this was coming back to David over and over and over again because he was reminded, so will you be reminded of those things that's in your life that happened way back when. But you made the wrong decision. And it affected you. But how about when it affects somebody else? In Psalms 37, 1, we can look at this and it says, by the, and of course this is out of Psalms and it's talking about the fact of during the captivity, it says, by the rivers of Babylon. They've been gone into Babylon. It said, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Whenever you read this psalm, it is a vow of remembrance. And it also is a prayer for judgment. That we remembered Zion. We remembered what it was in God's city. We remembered what it was in the temple. We remembered what it was whenever God restored and when God brought us through things in our life. We remembered, but now we're separated from that. We're not there any longer. We can go down and we can look at Peter in Mark 1472. And it says, in the second time, the cock crew, the Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Jesus told him, Peter, before the rooster crows, the second time, you're going to have already denied me three times. Oh, Lord, I'll go with you all the way. You know, that's what he had just confessed. But now he comes and he's saying, I don't know this man. I have not been associated with this man. And he denied him. You know, the grace of God, during this, despite this lapse in Peter and, and denying Jesus, Peter will be forgiven and Peter will be accepted and Peter will be restored again into the Lord's service. Whenever you come to the 16th chapter and the 7th verse, which you do not have, it says, but go your way and tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, and there ye shall see him as he said unto you. Tell Peter. Tell Peter to come on. And I know that when we're talking about tonight in denying Christ, when doing things in our life as a child of God, as a follower of Christ, that there is still forgiveness in those things. We go on back to Paul, named Saul, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. It says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meant to be, or I am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. In Acts 9, 4, you don't have this either yet, I'm sorry. The Lord said as on that Damascus Road meeting, it says, Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? He said, I'm persecuting the church of God. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Okay? It's me. When someone does something for or against a Christian, Jesus Christ not only knows, but he feels it, just as you do. When somebody is afflicting you, when somebody is speaking against you, when somebody is doing something against you as, as his child, he feels it. When the pain comes upon you because of someone coming against you for your stand in Jesus Christ, the Lord, he also feels it. But then we'll get a little deeper in things that we don't want to understand and we don't remember because it's painful. In 1 Chronicles 21, 17 it says, And David said unto, the God, unto God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered, and I am the one who has sinned and done this evil thing? But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. The Lord had sent a plague upon Israel. Seventy thousand men of Israel fell because of a decision David made. David had the people numbered. 
When he stood there before Goliath, he had a little slingshot and he had a rock. And he trusted God. Now he's king. And there's an enemy who is coming. And he has numbered the house of Israel at a million one hundred thousand. He's numbered the house of Judah over four hundred thousand men. And there are these armies that are going to go out against them and fight. David wanted to know how many was there. He sinned before God. Why did he sin? David was going to trust the strength of the number of men to do battle, not God. Now this is bringing a lot out in the fact that us as a believer, David sought after even the heart of God. It asks a question, in whom or what do we trust? Do we believe, believe God? Do we trust in him and what he's, what he's doing, what he said? I just got two more in the in reminders. In Matthew 27, 3, 3 and 5, it says, And Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself in verse 5 is what speaks up. One of the things that you relate to, and there are crisscrossy words that sometimes you kind of get in here. It says he repented himself, but uh, here this repented, it talks about, and, and as you look at it, there was a word that is used in Greek, and I'm not going to say this Greek word because we'll all get messed up, okay? But it means to regret. I'm sorry. To regret something. This is different from the word when we think about repenting that from the term of repentance for salvation. It was a totally different word. It's completely different. It's not the same thing. That in the midst of this, whenever he repented himself, it was not the fact that he asked God to forgive him and cleanse him. He was just sorry about it. And friends, there's a lot of times that we get sorry about things we have done in the past. And when we get sorry about things in our life, we've made mistakes. We're sorry about it. But one of the things here he says, here even when he says, I have sinned, it doesn't mean that he was remorseful. It doesn't mean anything else other than the fact that it was not a true confession of faith. He knew that he had done wrong. He just felt bad about the outcome. He had remorse. He felt bad about what was happening. And yet when we come to Hebrews 12, 16 and 17, and we're on our way, okay? 16 and 17 says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person such as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for you know how that would after that when he would have inherited the blessing that he was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. He was looking to get that which he had rejected. You know where it talks about in the very part it says here that if there be any fornicator or if there be a profane person, profane means godless. If there's a godless person like Esau, profane is to regard something as unhallowed, to treat something sacred as common, to be totally concerned with his temporary <laughs> material needs. It's about me. Being totally concerned with his temporary material needs, Esau gave them priority over the rights as the firstborn son the responsibilities of becoming heir to the promise that was going to be given. But when he wanted the blessing, he was rejected. The situation was irrevocable. Why? Because the blessing had been given to another. And I know this is a long way getting here. But the question is tonight, whenever we come through so much in our life when God desires to call us into a certain place into a certain ministry or part in our life and we just say no to him because other things are more important other things and we make all kind of preparations you know whenever we, we have our children the first thing you get is a little advertisement from the insurance companies. You want to buy some insurance, some college 
funding and stuff and you buy this and you buy that and you you have all these things because you can have peace of mind and you've got insurance on your house you got insurance on you you got life insurance you got all kind of insurances 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 friends we need assurance that we're going to see god It's not an insurance policy, but it is an assurance policy that we, in our life, that we're right before him. Because when we come and we look at the fact that we here, as a believer, where are we? Where are we tonight in our life? When we think about things that just don't pan out. And you might have to put another CD on because we're going to go about 15 more minutes, okay? Just tighten your belt because it's going to go fast. Yesterday. Yesterday there was a young woman I had met several weeks ago, and she has come from Michigan. She's living in the Lake Norman area, and she bought some stuff from me. She came back again yesterday, bought some more stuff. Talked about her friend who came and bought some stuff. So we're, we're in the stuff business, okay? I'm not going to tell you what stuff was, but it's concrete, all right? But whenever we're doing all these things, I started sharing with her. She started sharing with me. And in, in the mix of all this, you're somebody who's been transplanted from Michigan. She's getting ready to go back to Michigan to see her mother who has cervical cancer. And she's going to fly back. And we're standing there and we're talking and we're sharing, you know, those things and those needs and those things happening in that. And, of course, my wife is still under the tent and I'm down here speaking to this lady and she's probably saying, you know, what's he doing there? Why, da, 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 da. Anyway, she don't do that. But in the midst of all this stuff, it's a place of ministry. I remember yesterday was the day that I said that there was nothing, didn't look like it was going to be fruitful, nothing was going to come from it. And she said, I'll be back. We've got to talk some more because the door's been opened. And there was a lady who called me, and, and in my phone, her name is Linda Leaf. Because Linda called, and that's her first name, and, and she was calling about a concrete leaf that I was going to make for her. I kind of instructed her on how to take care of the leaf on the way because the leaf dries out, okay? Because I was going to have to make a concrete one off of her pattern <laughs> and whenever I was in the midst of this and talking to her then she came and I just want you to know how good God is she came and her husband came up and I, I couldn't even remember she said I talked to you several weeks ago and I was trying to put faces with people's voices and everything and sometimes for a fellow that's pushing some age can't remember all that but anyway, they came up, and he started talking. She started talking, and she had a bag, and she wanted seashells put on her leaf. So she had those precious things that she had collected. She wanted to put on there. Stand there talking to her, and there were things around her neck, and she had had surgery. She had spine surgery. She was having difficulties. And she looked over there at a little thing that we kid about a lot and everything, but it was a love leaf that we have. She wanted to know what it was. And I started sharing with her about this little leaf that you, you pour water on it continually. You, you, you let it grow from the water that comes on it. It's not in soil. It's just laying on top of it. It is your action of putting the water on it that causes it to grow, and it becomes a plant. And I had some that was on there on Facebook some time ago. And I know Kelsey B. had uh, made a comment on it because this leaf was broken. There was the end of it, and then there was the backside of it. Yet there were plants coming out of both ends of the plant, even though it was broken in two. And Kelsey said, how can it be? And I just responded to her, and I told this lady what I had told Kelsey. I said, love even can come from broken things. Her husband 
she started having tears coming down her face and what she had been through in surgery and even going through now and her husband said she needed that And I turned around and I put my hand up on her shoulder and I reached out for Sue's hand and she reached for her husband's hand. It was just the four of us. And we started praying for her needs and for her healing. She began to weep. And she hugged me. And then she come back and hug me again after that. And she says, nobody has ever done anything like that for me she was a lady that's up in the years she's a lady who has come to this area from another area from another state but nobody had ever come to touch her life before God you see this is why it's critical tonight for us to understand what God wants to happen in our life and very quickly, in the next few minutes, I'm going to read through this scripture. I want you to hear God's word speak. And then we'll close out. In Ephesians 5, 1 through 5. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanliness and covetousness, let it not be named once among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness or foolish talking nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. All these things speak to the fact that this is the way of the believer that you are to offer yourself as a sacrifice before God, a sweet-smelling aroma that God can smile upon it because none of these things are going to be there. There's no filthiness. There's no foolish talking. There's no jesting. There's these things that are not fitting, not given. That no fornicator or unclean person or covetous man nor idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. We're going to jump over to Colossians 3, 1 through 11 real quickly. I want you to hear this. And the reason I'm saying this and the reason the Lord had led me to this part is the fact that Paul not only addresses it one time, two times, several times in the letters. Why? Because this was wrong in all the churches. And friends, if it was wrong in Ephesus, if it was wrong in Colossae, if it was wrong in all these places where he has related to it in the letters, then, my friends, I believe that even in our midst, our midst it's wrong. Because it said then, in verse 1, said, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your th affections on uh, things above and not on things of the earth. For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil consequence, and it's a good word for that one, covetousness, and which is idolatry, all these things. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon children of disobedience. In which, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Remember there, it said that you once were like this. You were in this place. You were in the midst of this. One time you were there. Once time you walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blaspheming, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man. And there again, that off, you took it off. It's laid aside. It's not there no longer. Put off that old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. All that knowledge of Jesus. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, scython, bond or free. 
But Christ is all and in all. A new man. A person one becomes after conversion. He possesses a new nature. He possesses new values. He possesses new desires and aspirations in his life. He possesses a new lifestyle. He's a new man. And he is constantly being renewed or developed until he obtains a mature knowledge of God who recreates him. The more a believer knows and understands God, the more he will be like God in character and conduct. The closer you get, the more you get like him. Not only is the new man to put sin to death, but he's also to put away any man-made barriers that divide people and that nour nourish vices of an old life. These things have got to go. Among this renewed humanity of being a child of God, there are no national, ceremonial, cultural, or social distinctions. They're all gone. One of the things that you can understand that we have transformed from one place to another because we have become a child of God and every man is our brother. Every man is our brother. Every man that we see the fact that he is our brother, he, she is our sister because now there are no more distinctions. It does not matter what color of flesh they have. It does not matter what nationality they are. It does not matter where they came from. It does not matter where they live at. It does not matter in any of these instances. Nothing is to be a separator from you and doing God's work and God's spokesman, uh, as spokesman for him. There's nothing that will separate us. You can't say, I don't hang around that type. If you don't hang around that type or you don't go to that type, then how will they ever hear? How will they ever hear the word of God if you don't deliver it? And I know in, in the very fact that we need to understand to redeem Christ is all. That is, he is everything, that he is what matters most to them, he, and Christ is in all. That is, he dwells in all believers, whoever they are. He's in all. I thank God for what he has allowed us to do, places he has allowed us to go. I thank God for the very fact that in, in the midst of all this scripture, and I mean, we could go through and I could talk and talk and talk and talk, but I'm not going to do it because we're closing. I just want to remind you of something. Back in 1996, Yes, I was preaching, campground. We were there for some 30 years. There were a lot of things in my life that wasn't right. But God changed that. In 1996, and we were getting ready to go to Kenya for some six weeks, about six weeks. And I knew in my mind, I knew from what I had seen, I knew from what I had heard that it was going to be a different place and a different people, different tribes, different associations with people, everything. And I knew that in the fact that whenever you get there, if you have got any lustful thoughts or anything like that, that they're going to be tested. Because whenever you come and you understand that people there are not fully dressed or not, and many times you might see something you don't want to see, but the fact that whenever you come and you see these things, it is not to cause lust in your heart. Because it's norm to them. That whenever you go down the road and they ladies will be on the side of the road washing their one outfit of garments in, in the stream and they put them up on the, the bushes to dry and they'll stand there conversing with each other unclad during that time. And, and let me speak to this because God just put it there. It's the fact that it is not their dress or not the lack of their clothing that causes you to sin. It's a sin that's in your heart already. It's your desire that's in your life. It's not how somebody dresses or does not dress. 
that causes you to sin or causes things to come in your life is the very fact that it is already embedded in your heart. It is sin in your life. It is desire in your life that has to be conquered. It said back there in the scripture when it came through, it says it's got to be mortified. That means kill it. It's got to be dead. It can't be there. And I prayed to the Lord before we went that, Lord, shut my eyes, close them to all those things that could come that would cause me to look or to be uh, desirous of something that you might see, whether you want to or not. Close my eyes. And I thank God that he did because we saw. It was something that when we came and later on that was able to go to, to uh, South Africa, and the pastors who were there with us, and we had about 13, and we were in Margate and down on the coast of South Africa. And there was an invitation that went out from the mayor of Margate to all the school children to come out and to hear what these people have to say about Jesus. We had 11,000 middle school and high school students to come out on the soccer field to hear about Jesus Christ. And you say, well, why are you going to throw this in the middle? Because I hadn't thrown it yet, but it's coming, okay? But there were some girls who were there, young girls, teenagers, that in their celebration they were going to do a dance. And here, here's all the pastors and some of their wives were sitting on the platform and getting ready to go. I was out back and I was working with Coca-Cola bottles, okay? I, I was unscrewing the lid off the Coca-Cola bottles. I, I had a big job, Okay. Because these kids were coming through and they had never had Coke before. They had never had a cookie before. And we were giving them a Coke, and a drink of Coke in a cup and cookie. And I was undoing a bottle, sending it down the line. It was getting emptied and come back. I screwed the top back on it and put it back in the box and keep on going. And I was hearing what was going on. But one of the things that was happening that here and some of the wives laughed about it and they got a kick out of it. You know how ladies are that when these young women came up to present the dance, the tribal dance, they relieved themselves of their top because that was tradition. And that whenever they did this, of course, all the cameras that the pastors were taking pictures of, all everything and happening, all of a sudden they went off and went down, you know. And you say right here in the midst of it, well, that's their culture. That's where they're at. You've got to pray that God will send you to a place where you can come and you can share his word and you can share his grace even though you're going to be in a place where Satan can use something to change your mind, change your heart, and change your way. You've got to trust God to take care of it. And he does. Out of that 11,000 young men and women who were out on that field, 4,000 gave their life to Christ. 4,000. Because there's an 85% AIDS academic, the majority of them will never be 25 years old. He said they need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And therefore we went. Friends, that's the message for you tonight. There's a people out there that needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And just as I said in the very beginning, that 12 people turned the world upside down with the news of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you tonight, will you be a part of that? Will you be a part of delivering the word and it's not only the word that comes out of your mouth. It's not the scriptures that you memorize and you share. But you share what Jesus Christ has done in your life. How he has changed you. How he has transformed you. How the very fact that you're not whom you used to be. Because you are now a new man. A new woman in Jesus Christ. And all these other things have no holding upon you any longer. Because you have given it to him and you have been transformed. Old man's dead. And the scripture says if he's not dead, kill it. You have that authority. 
Mortify it. That's what Paul says. Mortify it. Put it to death. That it won't come up any longer. And the times of anger and, and all the things that will classify us as, no, they couldn't be a Christian. Let it be passed from us. Let us find a true new life in Jesus Christ. Because he and only he can bring transformation. He and only he can give you a new life. Because today there are a lot of actors and actresses. We've got our shirts that we wear. We've got our face that we put on when we come to church. We go through our different things in our life to put on the perfect picture for somebody to see me that today I'm worshiping God. Friends, how about tomorrow? Who are you going to share Christ with? Who are you going to take by the hand and pray for them that God will give them healing? Who are you going to stand beside of and weep with because their heart's broken? You know, we say, hey, we got a job. Yep, I just told you what your job is. No matter where you work, what position you carry, God has allowed you to be placed there for a reason and purpose. We looked at the tally yesterday. It paid for the gas to go to Denver and back. Denver, North Carolina, that is. But God whispered something in my ear. He said, Jim. Well, he didn't call me Jim. I called me Jim, son. It wasn't about the flowers or the concrete that you was going to sell. It was about lives that were going to be touched. That was the reason that you were here today, was to touch somebody's life, to allow me to change something in their life. That was your purpose today. You know, it makes you feel a whole lot better. It didn't matter what the till had in it. But that you went there and you fulfilled something greater than what money could buy or possess. Because God was there. And you allowed him to use you. It's my prayer tonight as we close that in your life, allow God to use you right where you're at. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you. I glorify you, Father, for the opportunity of coming, Lord God, before you and in this place, Lord God, that we can come and gather together. And Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that uh, we're going to be here for the next time, Father God, even after the amen is said. But Lord, if there's one here that wants to share, wants to talk, wants to speak, wants to ask a question, Lord, we're here and you're here. And, Lord, more than anything else is not what I can answer or what I can give advice. But, Lord, we look for you. Lord, where we come and we kneel at the altar or whether we stand and converse with you in the corner, whatever it might be, Lord, we come to seek you tonight, Father. And, Lord, use us. Transform us, Lord. That we, too, can say, even as the song said in the beginning, it is well with my soul. Lord, I'm all right with what you've called me to do. And I accept that charge. I thank you, Lord. Be with us, thy people. Take us, Father God, from this place to the field of mission outside these walls and even on the inside. Let us have knowledge of who you are. And Lord, thank you for letting us tell somebody about what you've done in our life. We glorify you, we praise you, and we magnify you in every way, even in our life, in our words, in our walk. Because, Lord, we're yours. It's all about you. None else. Father, let us feel your arms as you hold us. Walk us through this time, Father God, that we need your strength. 
We need your abilities. But, Lord, we just need to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Give somebody a hug and a welcome and a goodbye and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, guys, we're glad to have you, visitors, everybody. So just connect, connect, and connect. Okay? Good to have you, Jeff.